Do you know the Daniel Law? With more than 60 years of experience in the international intellectual property market, Daniel Law is not only one more IP law firm. Our outcome, our legally wise business solutions, can help you succeed in your initiatives and grow your business. With teams that work in cross-integrated functions, Daniel provides all kinds of services and intellectual property in Brazil and Latin America. If your business depends on intellectual property assets, come to Daniel. Welcome everybody to our webinar about IP essentials for doing business in Latin America and how to overcome COVID-19 impacts. Along the years, many corporations have undergone several difficulties and found unprecedented challenges in dealing with IP in Latin America, even those companies already operating here for many years. The lack of uniformity in the regional IP roles can be challenging, especially for those companies used to operate under harmonized and stabilized legal environments. The flip side of that reality is that the lack of harmonization also may bring some opportunities due to local improvements. To review how to navigate in this IP scenario, and learn the improvements in patents, trademarks, and copyrights, please enjoy the insights that will be shared by our speakers, Angelica Garcia, Kaylee Neumann, Maria Beatriz Delori, and our colleagues from different law firms, Alejandro Luna, Carlos Olarte, Federico Alman, and me and my partner, Robert Daniel Schur, Robert Daniel Schwartz. I will now turn the presentation to Angelica Garcia so she can share a little bit of her work and insights for us. Please, Angelica. Thank you, Roberto. Hello, everyone. Thank you, colleagues from Daniel Law for inviting us to this webinar and organizing it. So my name is Angelica. I am the UK Intellectual Property Attaché to originally Brazil, but now wider Latin American Caribbean. I work for the UK Intellectual Property Office, which is an independent agency from BASE. BASE is the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Department. The departments in the UK, they would correspond to the ministries, to the ministries in Brazil and most countries of Latin America. And the UK APO is the agency responsible for both rights granting of IP rights, so patents, trademarks, designs, and policy making. Uh, and we also work with copyright. And even though we are not an enforcement agency, we articulate the enforcement conversation in the UK to make sure that the, the stakeholders interested in this agenda, industry, enforcement agencies, government, they talk to each other, they understand the common challenges and that those challenges are reflected in our enforcement strategy. Uh, we have two offices. The main part of our colleagues, they are in Newport in Wales, but we also have an office in London. So the Atasha program is inside the IPO and we have Atasha's in five business that are in five countries, five markets that are important for our UK business. So there is me, I'm based at the consulate in Sao Paulo and I cover LATAC. We have uh, in India, China, 
Southeast Asia in Singapore, Washington. My colleague Kaylee is here and uh, she will yeah, explain what she does. And we also have a colleague in uh, WIPO in Geneva to work with the multilateral agreements. So what exactly we do? So what is the role of the attachists? We support British business that are either in those countries or that want to export to those countries to understand how to enforce and protect their P rights. And it goes from answering simple questions like, for example, the process to, to register um, a trademark, how to protect and how much it costs you to register a patent. But it also goes to more complex issues, for example, uh, engaging with local governments, engaging with stakeholders and helping them to understand the political context where IP is inserted. It's important to mention that we are not allowed to give legal advice. So when there's an issue that requires um, more in-depth IP uh, advice, we refer to our partners like Daniel Law, for example. Um, and what we see, I don't know if this is the opinion of my other colleagues, is that IP is becoming more and more political. So you need to understand the legal framework, but also the political environment, the political context where the IP is inserted in. So one side of our work should help business and the other side is to help the countries and is to work with countries where we are, understanding the IP challenges and helping them to improve the IP system. Our goal is to help create a global IP system that works for everyone everywhere. Um, so in Brazil, we work with two main agendas protection of IP and enforcement of IP. So on, on the protection side, our main stakeholder is INPI, is the Brazilian Patent Office, um, and Minister of Economy. Minister of Economy in Brazil is, is the parent uh, department of INPI. And it's interesting because when I, when I took over this role in 2016, I spent a week in Rio inside the NPI doing a job shadowing to understand their challenges, to understand, to learn more about the office. And I really realized that um, a lot of things have changed. One of their main problems is, is still the backlog. But for example, they had a big uh, trademarks backlog. They have now reduced it in order to join Madrid. They're still fighting. Uh, the patent backlog, but we really see the progressive changes the office is doing in order to be one of the best offices in the world. And they are really committed to that. And one of our main projects with INPI is by far the Prosperity Fund project. The Prosperity Fund is a project from the British government aiming at helping and supporting countries with medium, medium income. So this project uh, this is the third project we have now inside the Prosperity Fund. It, it aims at helping and supporting NEPI to be more efficient, to reduce backlog, to, to modernize, to be a more modern office, to have a more uh, modern IT system. It has just started and we are planning, we think it's going to last until I think it's, it's about three years. And the total investment, the three projects together, it is almost four million pounds. Also inside our relationship with NPI, we have a PPH sign, the Patent Prosecution Highway. We have launched uh, the Lumber Toolkit, with, which is a set of model agreement, agreements to help industry and uh, academia to work together on technology transfer projects. Um, we have just submitted some information uh, for NPI and Minutes of Economy because Brazil is now working on their first national IP strategy and they are going to use the UK IPO as one of the offices they are they are doing benchmark with. Um, so now talking about the enforcement side of our agenda here in Brazil. So we have signed an MOU with CNCP. CNCP is the national council um, that fights piracy in Brazil which is inside the Ministry of Justice. So as I was saying before, um, we really see that Brazil is really changing in the way they see IP, the importance of IP, both from protection side of IP and enforcement side of IP. And talking to some stakeholders working with the agenda in Brazil, they say 
there was never a better time to talk about IP in Brazil as it is now. Uh, and I think the government really understands the relationship between IP, innovation, economic growth, but also on the enforcement side, we see that it's easier to talk to the government when it comes to showing that piracy and counterfeiting, it's not only a problem for the industry, for the rights owner, but it is also a problem of public health, public security, it finances organized crime. So we, we find that our message here is more welcome than it was before. So inside this agreement also, we share a lot of experiences. Um, we had a webinar last month with uh, Federal Revenue, the National Health Surveillance Agency, um, and a lot of federal justice, um, Consumers Protection Agency, US government, French, uh, French government, to talk about the dangers of piracy related to COVID. Um, we have also signed an MOU with the Sao Paulo City Hall. The Sao Paulo City Hall is doing an amazing job fighting piracy. We had yesterday a meeting with Ancini. Ancini is, is Brazil's movie agency and Anatel, the telecommunication agency. They just put together a task force in order to work with uh, fighting piracy in Brazil as well. Uh, in 2018, there was the public attorney from CyberGaeco that went to the UK for a training. So he has learned some disruptive techniques to, to uh, take down websites with the IPO and with the, the, un the special unit inside the British police that deals with intellectual property crimes. He came back to Brazil. He's doing an amazing job in this agenda here. So now what we are doing, we created a group. So we are escalating this work to other parts in Brazil. And yesterday we had this, this video call with Ancini, with the British police, with the IPO, by the Beatriz and the US government, they joined as well um, to support their next steps. And we are um, working now on a media campaign to raise awareness of uh, the dangers of counterfeiting piracy inside the pandemic. Um, so what we see, as I said, what we see in Brazil is that Brazil is really is willing to work with us because uh, it doesn't make any sense to, to be in a, in a country uh, if they don't want to work with us. So, so we feel there's a, a big willingness to work with IP now. Um, and also, there are a lot of different stakeholders working with this agenda here, but what we see is that they're starting to create groups in order to optimize the efforts, in order to learn what the other is doing, to share expertise, to share intelligence. And this is very good news. Uh, there are still some challenges. I know my, my colleagues are going to talk about this. And as I said in the beginning, we were working originally with Brazil. We have now expanded our uh, work in other countries in LATAC. We went to uh, Colombia, Chile, and Peru last year to talk to local stakeholders, to IP offices, to understand how things work there, to see, um, to have a first conversation, to think further about how we can support uh, the business in those countries, but also work and develop um, a bilateral relationship in those countries like the one we have uh, here in Brazil. So um, I think I think that's it. Uh, and if you have uh, any other questions, I'm happy to, to answer them in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Angelica, for your speak. And thank you also for mentioning the Prosperity Fund, by far one of the most important, if not the most important, our Brazilian Patent Office have received. Thank you. I want to now turn to the audience and remind everyone that the we will have a Q&A session after all the presentations have gone. You can, at any time of this webinar, send your questions to the helpline email that was released during the invitation. I now would like to turn to Kaylee Norman from Washington, DC to continue the explanation about what the UK has been planning for the region. So Kaylee, please. Thank you, Roberto, um, and thank you very much to Daniel Law for hosting this event and inviting uh, my colleague Angelica and 
a U.S. colleague, Maria Beatriz, uh, to join this uh, webinar today. It's very exciting to get to speak to you all uh, from my living room. Um, so I am the North American Intellectual Property Attaché and Policy Advisor. Um, I am based at the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. Uh, so my region includes the United States, Mexico, and Canada due to uh, NAFTA, or now the USMCA, or TMAC, of course, as it's called in Mexico. Um, but I actually vary a little bit in, in how my role is structured, um, you know, in, in contrast to my colleague Angelica. Uh, my focus is actually largely, I would say 85% or so, focused on policy. Um, my background is actually working in policy and government. Uh, I previously worked for a member of Congress um, and was actually still working in the U.S. House of Representatives during uh, the uh, Democratic Working Group's uh, negotiations with USTR on, on updating or making changes to the, the base USMCA tax that was originally presented to Congress. Um, so a lot of my work has actually been primarily focused at the moment on uh, US-UK negotiations for free trade agreement. Um, so it's been very exciting to be able to pivot and start to focus a bit more on Mexico, um, especially for this presentation, as I haven't had much opportunity uh, to venture into that space. <clears throat> uh, so as I said, most of my focus is on policy, but I do do some business support, much like Angelica, um, which is largely advising uh, UK businesses interested in entering the US, Canadian, or Mexican markets on um, you know, various aspects of the intellectual property system, um, whether that's just logistically the structure and how it varies from the UK and the EU markets, um, or whether that includes uh, policy updates, um, you know, very much, as Angelica said, explaining the political situation um, and relevant uh, policy updates to various aspects of IP enforcement, whether that be legislation, uh, free trade agreement enforcement, um, or what have you. I'll admit that a, a decent amount of my business support work is just directing uh, UK businesses to speak to an attorney about uh, specifics, um, but it's, it's uh, definitely a very important aspect of, of getting into any market space is understanding differences in intellectual property structures and systems and enforcement. Um, so of course, uh, you know, focusing in on Mexico, I will admit that I have only just started working on Mexico. Um, my intention had been to start to expand more into the market um, or to integrating into the market this summer. And of course, like many other folks, my workflow has been affected uh, by the, the COVID-19 situation, unfortunately. Um, so most of the work that we have done in Mexico um, has just been in tracking enforcement and implementation of uh, TMAC or USMCA. Um, that said, the Intellectual Property Office had previously done a, a study of Mexico and the IP structure to determine uh, how or if they wanted to, to engage with the marketplace. And they determined that the IP framework in Mexico is actually pretty strong um, and is constantly improving. Um, there are you know, some ongoing concerns of enforcement, but we can talk about those in a little bit later. Um, we do plan to partner with colleagues in the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office where appropriate uh, in order to start to really have more of a presence in the Mexican market. Um, and of course, uh, Maria Diaz-Gis has a colleague, Cynthia Henderson, who is the U.S. Uh, attache based in Mexico, uh, who I've had the pleasure of meeting in person and, and being in touch with a bit, um, who's doing some great work there. Um, as I was approaching this webinar, though, of course, um, you know, really approaching it with my policy hat on, or my policy advisor hat on, as it were, um, as that is the, the larger focus of, of what my work looks at. Um, and I know that Alejandro will cover uh, the most recent intellectual property laws in Mexico in depth, but I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that I have been tracking um, from the, the perspective of the UK Intellectual Property Office. Um, so, of course, Mexico, much like the United States, has two intellectual property offices. So there's actually the um, National Institute of Copyright, or the Instituto Nacional del Derecho de Autor, um, and also the Mexican Institute of Industrial Property, or El Instituto Mexicano uh, de la Propiedad Industrial. Um, and much like the United States, uh, there is a patent and trademark office in the United States and a copyright office. Um, you know, both of those offices, of course, have largely been shut down due to the effects of COVID-19. Um, as have most offices uh, worldwide, uh, which is also part of why the implementation of USMCA or TMAC has been so interesting to follow from my perspective, uh, because of course that did require that Mexico create a system for um, intellectual property applications to be submitted online. Um, and I believe that they are largely in compliance with that part of the new NAFTA agreement um, if they have not actually already finished. Um, you know, some of the bigger 
policy changes that needed to happen or didn't need to. That's happened in Mexico in response to the USMC. Um, is that the, the Mexican government has acceded to the Geneva Act of the Hague Agreement, um, and that was done on, uh, in January of this year. Um, and then, of course, there was a most recent law uh, that was passed on the 30th of June um, that updated, or rather amended, um, the rights of the author legislation, as well as um, updated quite a bit of the, the, uh, in the Office of Industrial Property Legislation, or the Industrial Property Legislation, as it were. Um, so most of what uh, happened, or rather most of the policy changes that were required under the USMCA really were around copyright um, in terms of the largest changes. Um, and that includes just changing uh, the uh, length of copyright protections. Um, so the, uh, uh, any authored work is now protected for 70 years, or rather the life of the author of the work plus 70 years. Um, or for works created by organizations, it's now 75, uh, which is what it is in the United States as well. Um, then, of course, there's also uh, stronger protection and enforcement measures in the copyright space as well, including um, technological protection measures, as well as like website blocking provisions and rights management information. Um, in terms of or following through on um, continued copyright enforcement, uh, there is also provision of the uh, USMCA that required the adoption of a copyright safe harbor, uh, wherein websites that host content um, have a notice and takedown system for any content posted on the website that is in violation of someone's copyright. Um, and this is something that was in that June 30th legislation and that we'll be interested to see how it is enforced. Uh, it is actually a provision that's becoming fairly controversial um, in policy circles in the United States. Um, and it's sort of an ongoing uh, point of contention between the creative community and the, technology, or the, the big tech community. Um, there were also some provisions in trademarks and geographical indications, uh, largely protecting existing trademarked agricultural products, um, including mezcal and tequila in Mexico, um, as well as creating an online registr registration system to apply for and maintain uh, your own trademark. And then the patent space, uh, while there had been originally some pretty robust proposals in terms of uh, biologic provisions in particular, those were actually removed before the final version of uh, USMCA was passed by the US Congress. Um, so I know a decent amount of what happened in that space um, will be covered by Alejandro, I believe. Um, but you know, the, again, it's a, much of the sort of technical terms have been extended um, and uh, there are some adjustments to uh, various provisions related to medicines, uh, particularly generics, uh, wherein ingredients um, can be imported and tested during the last three years a patent is protected so that a generic manufacturer can be ready to hit the market when a, a patent expires for medicines. Um, so we have some ongoing concerns in, in the market overall that we're really interested you know, to see what enforcement of USMCA looks like. And as I said, we, we know that the, mark, or the, the structure of the IP system in, in Mexico is actually fairly robust. Um, but, you know, definitely also keeping an eye on uh, how enforcement provisions might change in relation to pirated uh, goods and um, pirated and counterfeit goods. So that's the word I was looking for. Uh, as we know, this is an ongoing problem. Mexico and enforcement is often um, a difficult, enforcement is often difficult. Um, it definitely something that sort of exceeds the UK intellectual property office's uh, abilities to address. Um, and of course, as we move forward, uh, we're you know, very much looking forward to working with our colleagues in the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office uh, and, and really to accessing the market here moving forward. Um, and yes, I believe I actually am wrapping up a little bit early, but I, as Angelica said, very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much for your explanation. You have quite an important territory to take care We'll listen to Mexico very shortly. I want to share with the audience that some of the presenters will have slides. You please feel free to make your notes as you wish. And after this presentation, uh, we will, after this webinar, truly speaking, we will uh, release to every one of you all the slides you will be seeing and also on complete audio so you can listen to everybody over again. With no further delays, I would like to invite Maria Beatriz Delori. Maria Beatriz is the IP attache for the United States Patents and Trademark Office. 
Maria Beatriz will be joining us by phone and will not be using slides. So Maria Beatriz, uh, please feel free to go ahead when you're ready. Thank you very much, Roberto. First of all, I want to make sure everybody can listen to me. Yes. Is the audio on? Okay, wonderful. It's Thank you very clear. much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Roberto. I hope I actually managed to be loud and clear to entertain our guests only with my voice. I may not say as so. So let's hope it, it works in this format. Thank you so much, Danielle Law, Roberto, and other colleagues for the invitation for this timely event. It's always wonderful to have the opportunity to share experiences and know what colleagues are doing at the same witness what are the big challenges and issues uh, that uh, attorneys are, are facing throughout the region. So I've already learned a lot. and. I'm sure we'll keep learning throughout the rest of the afternoon. So as Robert mentioned, I work for the USPTO office based in Brazil, and I cover the Mercosul, Guyanas, and Suriname. Uh, to present a little bit of the USPTO office, uh, to provide you with some numbers that I find quite interesting. So in fiscal year 2019, we had uh, a little over 2,000 employees, and of this total, a little over 900 employees were patent examiners. So our agency pretty much has three thirds, uh, uh, I mean, three fourths of its employees dedicated to the examination of patents. Fiscal year 19 was a very interesting year regarding numbers because we received more than 1 million uh, applications combining patents and trademarks. It's uh, an interesting number and milestone. And on the same year, we issue approximately 65% of that number in uh, trademark registrations and patent uh, and letter patents. Uh, of course, we are not as fast as issuing any IP rights on the same year of the application. Uh, so the applications that we issued, uh, that we granted, that matured registrations fiscal year 19 were priorly submitted. Uh, to be more clear, uh, our uh, current uh, approximate uh, time for a final decision on the trademark front is 9.3 months, and for patents, it, it is 23.8 months. So this is a little bit of our scenario. Our mission as uh, an agency foster innovation, competitiveness, and job growth. Through the of first and foremost, examining patent and trademark applications in a timely manner and keeping high qualities. This will, will allow uh, citizens in general and stakeholders in particular to understand and to a reliable and predictable IP rights system. This is very helpful to promote uh, innovation and investment in innovation and technology in, in the US, we believe. Other than examining patent and trademark applications, we also help uh, foster and, and prepare the IP policy in the US. We work to improve uh, instruments and systems of IP protection, and finally, we to, to spread the word of IP, so providing information and, and education on the matter worldwide. Beyond our mission, we also have in our strategic plan uh, the, the mission, the, the goal of improving IP policy, enforcement, and protection worldwide. So our activities are not restricted to the domestic environment in the US, but also we try to, to improve the IP framework internationally mandate, the IP attache program was created at, at, at the USPTO 
approximately 15 years ago. Uh, and uh, we have been expanding this program as it is considered a very successful one. And I'll mention right now the list of countries where we have uh, attaches. Please, anyone who is interested in having the contact of attaches in other regions, in other countries, please let me know, and I'll be more than glad to introduce you to my local colleague. So we have attache offices in China, India, Thailand, Belgium, Switzerland, and for Switzerland, our representative is mostly dedicated to multilateral bodies uh, and work on that front, such as WIPO and WTO, Ukraine, and Kuwait. Now, in our Latin American region, as I mentioned, uh, I'm based in Rio, and I cover Mercosur, Guyanas, and Suriname. We have a colleague based out in Mexico, covering Mexico, Central America, and Central America and the Caribbean. And finally, a colleague in Peru, covering Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. So we try to, to be present as much as possible in many important economies and markets. So our mandate as uh, IP attaches and IP attache representatives is to try to improve policies, laws, and regulations to foster the IP uh, environment abroad with an eye of benefiting our U.S. stakeholders. We do this in multiple ways, starting from presenting and explaining U.S. government positions in any IP-related matter, to raising particular issues and concern, concerns with those governments, providing trainings, uh, conducting pl public awareness activities, etc. This, uh, we also uh, work to provide information to U.S. stakeholders who are trying to enter these markets or have some uh, specific questions conducting business in the particular and relevant markets. Uh, as Angelica mentioned, we also have a limitation providing uh, legal services uh, to U.S. stakeholders, but we are always glad to provide a general overview of what's going on. Uh, for instance, uh, for stakeholders who want to know how to navigate foreign laws and regulations, how foreign courts and governments work, and how to protect and enforce IP abroad are questions that we are ready to address. When they become more specific to uh, a given title holder, uh, this title holder needs to engage with local council, but this is we generally provide a broad explanation of the environment. And also, as previously mentioned, how uh, politics is coming into play more and more often, and it's an important aspect that we need to keep in mind uh, to to provide uh, interested parties in this these countries, because this has influenced a lot uh, the trends in intellectual property. Now, a couple of examples of the activities that we generally conduct. We can mention, for instance, the fact uh, that we have a memorandum of understanding with Brazilian INPI. So under this framework, we have a robust uh, exchange of information with uh, the Brazilian Patent and Trademark Office in all sorts of matters, including telework, regional offices, quality controls, etc. Uh, we also try to have training of examiners in their countries, so we have conducted a number of trademark examination workshops for instance, in Brazil at uh, INPI's headquarters. Uh, we also try to cooperate uh, with the private sector and associations to conduct events on awareness, on IP awareness, uh, 
in general uh, on specific matters as well. For instance, uh, it was mentioned before the PPA that INPI Brazil has a number of countries. We also uh, have a PPA agreement with INPI. He conducted a series of events to bring information to the general public to uh, look at how the system would work. And we also had, I remember, I believe, Roberto, it was one of the first times we had the honor and the possibility to work together. It was an interpad forum where we had discussions on biotech innovation. This was a really interesting event that congregated private sector and uh, Brazilian officials on this very specific and sophisticated topic. And of course, we uh, do conduct a good amount of enforcement related activities. Uh, just yesterday, and I find it interesting that yesterday seemed to be a busy day in the webinar agenda in Brazil, we had uh, an event uh, through our Department of Justice. We had an event with uh, the Brazilian prosecutor's office on, on how to address uh, Top fire, uh, uh, websites that are selling products uh, that are counterf counterfeit or simply fake or just uh, are trying to deceive consumers in the con context of COVID-19. Uh, we also had in the past, uh, we also have in the past received Brazilian judges for a judicial uh, workshop a regional judicial workshop on IP enforcement at USPTO headquarters. So they, they came to visit us along with other judges from the Latin American region for, the, for this event and also have recently conducted uh, an event on the illicit trade of counterfeit agricultural chemicals. So we try to be very expanded in the nature of our activities and the thought topics that we touch upon, and we are always willing and open to hear from stakeholders what are their biggest concerns, how we can cooperate, and what uh, can we do potentially to increase and bring more activities and topics to our table. As a final comment, I would like to mention that uh, at USPTO's website, USPTO.gov, we recently launched uh, a USPTO COVID-19 Response Resource Center. Uh, as soon as you get in our website, you, you will see a hyperlink there for that resource center. And we are trying to create uh, a wealth of information uh, regarding measures that are being taken specifically regarding this pa pandemic. This goes from uh, uh, marketplace platforms that allow for a facilitated interaction between investors, companies, uh, and inventors uh, to our fast track programs connected to COVID-19 to uh, contact to, to other uh, U.S. government agencies that deal with the problem of fraud and counterfeiting in this particular context. And finally, uh, some international resources that are very useful for those who are trying to have an, an, a global overview of what's going on. So this is a little bit of what we do generally and are doing now in the context of COVID-19, and it will also be a pleasure for me to answer any questions that you may have at the end of this uh, panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Beatriz. I also want to thank Angelica and Kaylee for the brilliant work. Terrific job you have been doing, ladies. So it's uh, very nice having a broad regional view from your perspective. But now we will turn to a more, let's say, local view, exploiting a little bit more country by country comprising the region, starting with our colleague Alejandro Luna, who will uh, discuss Mexico and the new IP law in Mexico. So Alejandro, whenever you're ready, please 
feel free to start. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, can you, uh, thank you. Thank you, Roberto, and thank you to Danielle uh, Law Firm, uh, the speakers and the audience, uh, to allow me to talk about the opportunities in Mexico related to IP, especially in a moment in which uh, Mexico, in one hand, we have, a, we have a new law, a new free trade agreement in, in place or in force. But on the other hand, uh, in Mexico, we are in the peak of the pandemic of uh, COVID-19 with the corresponding uh, impact in our economy. And uh, talking about economy in a worldwide economy highly damaged by COVID-19, the free trade agreements, especially USMCA, uh, this treaty with uh, Mexico, US, and Canada will be very important for the economic recovery, not only for Mexico, but also for the entire North American region. Uh, next one, please. Um, 30 years ago, um, and in preparation of uh, at that moment uh, NAFTA, our current IP law was enacted in 1991. Obviously, uh, 30 years after the current statutory law is uh, obsolete. Uh, obsolete. Um, CPTPP, the treaty with the European Union and the USMCA motivated the review modernization and a higher standard of protection for the entire IP system, which indeed it was already a, a duty. Uh, this slide and the next two slides are just a, 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 an example of the complexity during the negotiations of this so-called last generation free trades agreement, where IP is only one, or it was only one of the various topics and positions under negotiation by the involved parties. And in the case of CPTPP, we had 11 countries with, uh, with different uh, offensive and, this, and defensive uh, interests and positions. And uh, where the topics were from the labor, ecologic, gender, highly debated and, uh, and, and, and intellectual property was in between of all these complex uh, 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 negotiations in the free trade agreements. Next one, please. Uh, I, this one, I just want to highlight some of the sensitive uh, issues for the countries uh, during these negotiations. For example, in the case of uh, Mexico with the USMCA, the automotive sector was key and essential uh, uh, for Mexico. Uh, uh, for Canada and their pro progressive uh, proposals, labor, gender, ecologic issues were very, very important for the negotiations. Uh, in the negotiations with the European Union and Mexico, geographical indications was very, very sensitive. And uh, although this uh, treaty, it is not um, in force already in Mexico, we expect to have it in force within the next two years, they have very, very important uh, uh, standards of IP that uh, uh, in addition to what we have already in the USMCA, and uh, CPTPP obviously uh, uh, impacted uh, our IP law and actually the, the entire chapter of geographical indications, it was uh, uh, passed in, in, uh, by, the, by the Congress in Mexico uh, for purposes to get this, uh, this treaty with the European Union. Uh, next one, please. Uh, in USMCA, but also in CPTPP, the so-called pharmaceutical patent package, it was one of the most debated um, 
uh, uh, issues within the within both uh, uh, negotiations. And, uh, and the data package exclusivity, it, it was the, the last moment uh, a decision during the negotiations. Uh, very late in the, in, the, in the night prior to announce the closing of negotiations of CPTPP and USMCA, data pack exclusivity was discussed and debated two hours before the closing of the negotiations. Next one, please. Finally, on July uh, 1st um, of 2020, and after uh, almost five years of negotiations of CPTPP, two years of negotiations of USMCA, we, uh, uh, the Mexican uh, Congress and the corresponding uh, uh, authorities of the of the Paris in these two um, treaties, uh, the, uh, they approve the treaties, and in order to get in force the USMCA on July the first, the Mexican Congress uh, passed uh, six of the seven so-called uh, USMCA laws. Only the uh, plant variety law uh, was not um, uh, discussed in the Congress because it was uh, rejected for some political issues. And, um, uh, but the, the new industrial property law and uh, some amendments to the federal uh, copyright law, uh, were, uh, they were approved, it was first already discussed and approved by the Mexican Congress in order to be enforced uh, in this, at the same time uh, that the USMCA entered into force July the 1st. Uh, next one, please. Regarding the amendments to the copyright uh, new law, obviously there's too much to say about this new law. Uh, the, but for time constraint, I just, I just highlighted the most important issues of the, of, of the new law compared to what we have before. And I will, I will try to summarize that the, the most relevant changes are the incorporation of uh, uh, technology, te technological protection measures and digital right management, as well as the sanctions for any type of uh, circumvention. Actually, that part was included as a crime in our uh, uh, criminal, criminal law. Uh, needless to say that the notice and takedown uh, uh, mechanism it was highly divided, debated during the, the negotiations, but now we have a procedure established in our uh, copyright law of notice and, and, and takedown. Uh, from procedural reasons, uh, they, now it's clear that any type of recordation, annotation, or description uh, before our copyright agency can be challenged before our specialized IP court. Next one, please. Uh, talking about patents, um, the main changes, I would, I would only mention the, the most uh, relevant changes, and I'm just going to highlight uh, the, the relevance of, this of these uh, changes, uh, because again, for, for time constraint, it's not going to, it, it is not possible to go in on details. Uh, uh, there is an obligation in the treaties that now it is uh, recognized in, uh, in, our, in our law, of this uh, digitalization uh, uh, um, uh, environment uh, for all type of proceedings. Uh, in our Mexican Patent Office, it was already implemented for trademark. It was working uh, uh, properly. Uh, it, it, it very recently, it was open and during the pandemic, it was opened for, for patents. Uh, obviously, it is uh, under test uh, for that. Uh, and obviously the time is going to, uh, 
confirm whether this uh, online system uh, works properly and have more advantages than the traditional uh, filing of, on paper. But now it's also recognized in our uh, statutory law. Uh, fortunately, and this was very, very important uh, in this uh, new law, that we have a provision which uh, the wording is very positive uh, to sustain the uh, patentability of new uses. That, that was very important because one of the amendments to the USMCA in the, the protocol of amendments of the USMCA that was uh, approved uh, in December last year, the provision establishing the obligation to consider new uses of patentable subject matter was removed from the, from the USMCA. So there was some concerns that the new law will not recognize uh, the new uses as patentable subject matter. And actually there were a couple of proposals uh, to try to get in this new law a, a provision, an express prohibition of new uses. Fortunately, the provision was rejected, the, the pro prohibition of new uses was rejected, and we have some wording that are very positive to sustain the patentability of new uses. Uh, regarding Russia volar exception, this uh, temporality of uh, eight years for biologic patents and three years for chemical patents in the Russia volar exception in order to use a, a patented product prior to the expiration of the date of the patent just uh, uh, to get the corresponding health registration with the approval. The temporality was removed, only the eight years for biologics and three years for biologic, uh, for chemicals. They were removed, so now they can start the studies at any time prior to the expiration date of the patent. Um, we have now an entire chapter for patent term compensations. That was also um, uh, in compliance with, with, uh, with USMCA, in which a delay is considered more than five years after the application uh, of the patent to the granting date. More than five years could be considered a delay, and the uh, mechanism is the one day of compensations per two days of delay. The compensation cannot exceed more than uh, five years, but there are many rules that should be observed in order to apply properly this, uh, uh, this uh, mechanism of patent or compensation, but that is a very, also very good news. Uh, it is pending the, uh, the compensations for delays in the regulatory uh, uh, frame, uh, but that has a transitional period of uh, four and a half years in the USMCA, so we need to wait this period. Well, there is no need to wait for that period of time, yeah. but that is the reason that is not included. Next one, please. Yeah, uh, Alex, as you had requested me, I want to let you know that it's 13, 13 minutes already, okay? Okay, uh, some um, uh, impeach practices were formalized in our new um, a law, for example, the voluntary division of patent applications, uh, the sanctions for double patenting, and the public uh, domain um, uh, uh, publication. Uh, next one, please. Patent linkage is now established in our IP law. Before it was only in the regulation, um, and that the the, there is an obligation that within the next uh, 120 20 days, the both agency, the patent office and the regulatory agencies should enact in the regulation, the new uh, 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 system uh, of patent uh, linkage that should include a notice to the title holder as established by the USMCA. Next one, please. Regarding trademarks, I'm just going to say that again, some of the IMP practices were, uh, you know, implemented uh, again in, a, in, in the law, especially in the law. The, I have some examples here. Uh, next one, please. 
If you can please uh, wrap up, Alex, uh, I want to remind everyone that the slides will be released later on along with the full recording of the audio. So if, no, if any slide is not possible to be seen now, it can be seen later on. Thank you. Okay. The most uh, relevant changes in the trademark law is uh, this um, um, uh, link between and the uh, uh, impacts and effects of the uh, opposition system, the trademark opposition system, and the invalidity actions. There are some rules already in order to clarify when there is a persecution of invalidity actions when an opposition has already decided. You know? And the, the, in general terms, it's just, uh, it is possible to file the invalidity action if the prongs are different. Something also, also something new. We have partial cancellations uh, and uh, uh, partial invalidity provided for trademark registrations, limited to the product and services. Next one, please. Uh, this is the this is enforcement. I will try to summarize that this in the in the next uh, two minutes. And uh, this is the problem that we want that, that the new law want to solve. Right now, you need to exhaust all the administrative proceeding. And once that you have final decision, you can go to a civil court to claim damages. This long path is trying to be solved in the new law with the, with the following um, uh, system. Next one, please. With stronger preliminary injunctions for products in transit, that is a very, also very good uh, news. Uh, with a, a ponderation of a uh, weighting of rights in the implementation of lifting of injunctions. Next one, please. And uh, next one, please. And in a claim of damages that it is, there is going to be an option of the title holder to pursue the infringement action before the Mexican Patent Office or to go directly through a civil court to claim damages. So that is the good news. Now we have two venues to try to claim damages before MP through an incidental proceeding or before a court of law. That is the good news. The bad news is that there is a provision. Next one, please. Yeah, Alejandro, really, we really have to, um... Yeah. Ask you yeah, to yeah. please no, conclude no. your slides. I think it's very yes. exciting and all the subject matters are very new. But again, the slides will be released and your email address will be freely available for all the uh, participants in the audience so they can contact you afterwards. Thanks, Thanks very much for going Thanks. In, in depth and for the clear explanations. Thank you. We'll now uh, turn to Brazil. I want to invite my partner, Robert Daniel Schwartz, to talk about trademarks and other issues. So uh, Robert, whenever you're ready, we'll be glad to hear it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Roberto. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robert Daniel Schwartz. I'm a partner at Daniel Law, and I was invited to give a few comments on the trademark landscape in Brazil. Uh, although there are many interesting issues, also on the copyright side, I, I, I guess that Due to time constraints, I'm going to focus on uh, one particular issue, which I think is still a very much of a, of a hot topic in Brazil and is still generating a lot of uh, discussion, which is uh, the Merged Protocol. So um, the Merged Protocol has been a long time um, wait for Brazil. There's been long expectations around uh, Brazil joining. And finally, as of October 2nd, 2019, it's been possible to designate Brazil. Uh, of course, we have to congratulate the, the Brazilian PTO. They, they had a huge effort to tackle a lot of issues to have uh, Madrid being implemented so quickly, uh, especially dealing with the, the trademark backlog. Um, so if you de dealt with Brazil a couple of years ago, you'll remember that a trademark application could take more than three years to be examined in some cases. And now we're, we're having an average of nine, 10 months for examinations, so that's really a great job on, 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 their, on their side. Uh, however, with every new system, um, there, there are a few new challenges. 
and there's still room for improvement in the sense that uh, there's still harmonization needed in a few aspects in relation to uh, Madrid. So on that front, I wanted to discuss what has been, uh, we've been hearing a lot lately around Brazil as to whether there is the need or not to designate local council if you're filing through Madrid. Of course, uh, applicants would expect that using Madrid, you'd be able to centralize all communications uh, without needing to designate local council, unless for spe specific reasons like uh, answering office action or dealing with a provisional refusal. But uh, the truth is that Brazil has a provision in its uh, IP law that states that if you're a foreign applicant, it is mandatory for you to have a local representative with uh, powers to, to receive summons. And that is mainly because uh, if, if you're trying to, for example, cancel a registration of a foreign applicant, unless you have someone in Brazil that can receive summons, you'd be able to go, you'd have to go to the very lengthy and costly pr process of a rogatory letter. So of course that is not uh, in the best interest of not even well, Brazilian applicants and also other foreign applicants that might be dealing with a, an application owned by another foreign applicant in Brazil. Um, this provision was not suppressed in our Brazilian IP law. Uh, and therefore, there has been some debate as to whether uh, if you are a foreign applicant that designated Brazil and you have not designated local council, if uh, once that designation is accepted by the PTO, if it would be susceptible to uh, cancellation. Um, there's still uh, no, real, no real answer about that. The Brazilian PTO, as we understand, has been of the position that they would not take uh, actual action to cancel that registration. But the point is that as it is a valid provision in force of a Brazilian IP law, any interested party could file uh, a lawsuit uh, aiming to request a cancellation on those grounds. And uh, if you ask my opinion, there's a, 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 an actual real risk of those registrations, those Brazilian designations without local represent, representation of being canceled. So this is something that we're still debating and something that we have to uh, discuss for harmonization. Uh, another topic around Madrid and sort of connected to this first one is uh, regarding petitions filed by third parties against Brazilian designations. So according to the PDO who released this on their uh, updated trademark guidelines, uh, although most of the communications will be sent to WIPO as is usual, if an opposition is filed against a Brazilian designation, uh, they will only publish that information on the official bulletin in Brazil. Therefore, you would need at least local council to be monitoring that official bulletin to ensure that you, you're able to timely file a response to that uh, opposition. And uh, on, the same, on the same front, um, if you look at non-use cancellation actions or even administrative nudity proceedings, uh, there's also a lot of doubt as to what exactly will happen because in that case, in those cases, the Brazilian PTO uh, only mentioned that they would report decisions around those petitions to WIPO. However, that leaves the, the question as to whether they would, similar to the oppositions, refrain from informing of the filing of those petitions in the first place. Uh, in case of oppositions and administrative nullity proceedings, that the lack of a defense uh, will not render um, a decision by default. So at least that is a sort of positive news on that front. However, with non-use cancellation actions, if you do not file evidence of use, then uh, it will be accepted and you will lose uh, that registration. So uh, of course, there's still a lot of room for improvement regarding Madrid. Um, the PDO has received over 5,000 Brazilian designations. However, they haven't examined any of them so far since uh, October, 2019. So we haven't really dealt in practical terms with these issues, but uh, if, you, if you probably received a warning from your local council, I think it's worth discussing if it's possible for them to at least monitor the cases on your behalf, if, even if you uh, file through uh, Madrid, given the risks of cancellation or at least of not actively defending uh, your cases in Brazil. So I believe uh, that covers what I thought would be interesting regarding Madrid for Brazil. I'm not sure if I still have some time because Roberto, we're, we're splitting our time so I can talk about trademarks and he can talk about patents. So with that, uh, I'll pass it over to Roberto 
And if you have any questions in the end, uh, feel free to send them over to me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Robert. It's a quite interesting scenario in which we have the Madrid protocol. However, uh, all the applicants uh, must be mindful about the way that the protocol has been implemented in the sense there are some mismatches between the Madrid rules, so to speak, and the Brazilian legislation. And of course, as all of you here listening to this webinar can imagine, the legislation has precedence over the uh, rules or minor rules. But this is uh, something really important. So, uh, okay, let me again introduce myself. I'm Roberto Ribeiro. I'm a partner to the Daniel Law. In my background, I have more than 33 years working for multinational companies in leading IP positions, leading IP departments uh, all over the world. So I'm now uh, responsible primarily for patents. I also deal with other matters, of course, but primarily for patents. And my objective here is, given the time limitation, share with you some uh, recent improvements, some news, and some insights, things that you should really be mindful about when considering working in Brazil. Well, and for those already working in Brazil, to you know, uh, renew the attention over the topics. So in my quick presentation of around five minutes, I'll tap the legal scenario at a glance. I'll give you an idea on how the legislation is and mention the latest improvements. I'll also go over some challenges imposed by COVID-19. Mainly the issue of compulsory license is back to the stage again. Uh, we'll also discuss some litigation aspects and I'll share with you relevant discussions going around it. And from all that I will speak, you can, you will be able to notice how IP and politics interplay in Brazil. Next slide, please. Well, uh, in terms of legal landscape, very quickly, I would say that Brazil is in line with the international general practice, considering the Brazilian IP law, which dates back to 1997, included the treaties to which Brazil has adhered to. Uh, there is one exception, however, in terms of general alignment, that is the role played by the regulatory agency on visa. It's equivalent to the American FDA. In Brazil, according to the Brazilian IP law and the second law that was enacted in 2001, the Anvisa agency has the role of examining patent applications along with the Brazilian Patent Office. That was a real mess in the beginning because not, when this law was implemented because not only the INPA or the Brazilian Patent Office didn't have clarity about which roles each one should play, Anvisa didn't have clarity. Things got a little bit better, I would say much better in 2017 when there was an arrangement here in terms of rules and regulations and Anvisa was uh, had a more clear rule in examining pharmaceutical patents, meaning a limitation to do basically two things, a veto for patenting substances that can bring some uh, health issues or are forbidden subst substances, as well as for providing voluntary as yes, third party opinions for the application so the Brazilian Patent Office, the INPI, can read and consider or not those opinions in examining pharmaceutical patents for certain specific therapeutic ends. And by the way, Brazil, yes, is a PCT country for many, many years, since 1978, which gives a general idea that things go well here. Thank you. So next slide, please. In terms of patent pa prosecution, many are the ways to expedite your patent prosecution. You can uh, rely on the patent prosecution highways, the so-called PPH programs with more than 50 countries and the granting is expected to happen in only five, uh, eight months. If you have a green patent or a startup, many things can be done to expedite your patent application. However, two things really deserve some emphasis. The first thing is that the automatic granting for medications dedicated to COVID-19 related diseases, they have the automatic granting of expedited applications. 
And very importantly, I could not leave this slide without mentioning the program that has been launched by the Brazilian Patent Office to reduce the patent backlog, relying on foreign previous examinations. Under this program, the uh, number of examinations or patents pending from examination was reduced in about 75% in only seven months from the beginning of the program. Next slide, please. Having a patent application granted is always good, but sometimes much better succeeding well in a litigation using the patent to be enforced. In that context, I would say that in general, Brazil can be considered a pro-plaintiff or a pro-patentee jurisdiction. We have an independent judiciary. There are no bias against foreign companies. We operate under the civil law system. And importantly, judges have no expertise in IP law and no technical background. It does not mean at all that the decisions are all wrong or in bad faith because of that, but also turns the attention to the importance of the legal expert during the, this, during the uh, prosecution of your judgment. Next, please. Still in patent litigation, preliminary injunctions are a very powerful tool to be used, especially for those who need them frequently and fast. And as important aspects that I would like to emphasize in obtaining preliminary injunctions in Brazil, differently from other jurisdictions, in some cases, there's no need to give notice to the defendant. Export injunctions are possible. If you post a bond, there's no the other side or the flip side of the defendant posting a counter bond. It says usually awarded at the speed of light, as I used to say, in 48 hours, maybe a week. So this is quite fast compared to other jurisdictions. In Japan, for example, a preliminary injunction may take six months or, or a year to be granted and plaintiffs are allowed to have exporting chambers meeting with the judges. And those times, of course, of COVID, that's not happening anymore, but usually it is. Next slide, please. The uh, legal arguments accepted in litigation are the usual ones in most of the jurisdictions. So we accept doctrine of equivalence, inducement, contributory infringement, if you were awarded for a compensation, the compensation can be for lost profits plus actual and moral damages. We don't operate using Markman hearing, so we don't have to adjust the claim scope or construe the claim scope along the, along the judgment. And permanent injunctions are well, uh, are as well as uh, injunctive quick measures, a common remedy. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to call the attention to everyone for a, a discussion that is happening since back 2016, and it affects all industry sector, it is a lawsuit filed against paragraph one of article four of the Brazilian IP law. Uh, this, uh, this article regulates that the patent must have minimum of 10 years from the granting date and utility models seven years from the granting date. What is happening here is that this article is being challenged and has lacking constitutional grounds to proceed. Many are the entities joining as a Michi Curie and many are the others, uh, many are others uh, saying that the uh, case should be uh, decided as soon as possible because it, it affects many industry sectors. So this is something that if someone has any interest in knowing more in that field, please feel free to email me and I'll be happy to answer that. Next one, please. Another important discussion that was brought by the COVID-19 issue was the COVID-19 compulsory license discussions. So we have currently three, three bills of law pending at the House of Representatives. Multiple non-governmental organizations are putting a lot of pressure to approve and facilitate compulsory license in Brazil. The government has already said they are against compulsory licenses, which makes all sense. First of all, because we have already a well-regulated 
environment for compulsory licenses in the Brazilian legislation, fully compliant with the TRIPS and other uh, treaties we have joined. And secondly, because the conditions that these uh, three bills of law are trying to put into effect are conditions that understandably violate other situations of the Brazilian law. So that was the, uh, I think next one, please. That was all the uh, presentation I had to do. I would like to thank everyone for the audience and turn the, the, the stage to Carlos Olarte, please. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so just uh, running right into my presentation, I just, uh, these are some points I want to touch uh, rapidly on in uh, 10 minutes, right? Um, jumping into general IP comments for Colombia, uh, just uh, giving you a very high level uh, review. Next slide, please. Um, I think in general, uh, an observation for Colombia is that there is a, a pro-innovation environment even before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, this president, uh, particularly more on the copyright sector, the entertainment law sector, uh, kicked off his campaign and carried it through his presidency, uh, trying to push um, uh, the importance of innovation on the economy. Uh, he wrote a, a book on the orange economy, more related again to the uh, uh, cultural and uh, entertainment uh, aspects of the um, of innovation, but I think that's carried through into other sectors. Regarding COVID-19 specifically, there have been specific grants and funds opened up for um, projects related to providing solutions to any issue related to COVID-19, including paying, for example, for patent drafting, for filing, for, for prosecution. Uh, now, the only downside there regarding COVID-19, at least for, for me, the way I see it, is in, in, a, in a recent decree, there's uh, buried in the language uh, in the decree, there's an open declaration of public interest for COVID-19 pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and PPEs. Um, there's some discussion related to what the impact of that compulsory license, whether or not that in turn means that there's an automatic compulsory license, for example. I don't believe it is. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to field them later on. Um, but that is my take on, on compulsory licenses right now uh, regarding COVID-19. Um, another just important thing to take into account for Colombia is we are part of the Andean community, and as such, uh, our law is essentially based on Andean community law, not domestic law. So, for example, if you're going to be doing any lobbying here, you don't lobby before the, the Senate or Congress, but rather you have to get a hold of the ministers of commerce of Peru, of Ecuador, of Colombia, and of Bolivia. And judicially, that also means that we have to often seek uh, opinions of law on in different matters before the Indian Court of Justice, which is uh, kind of serves like an, an ECJ in Europe uh, regarding harmonizing judicial decisions. Next slide, please. Um, as far as patents, uh, some two slides here. We're, we're pretty quick, just uh, without being pushed. Our, our average is 22 months. Uh, our grant rate is pretty much on par with global averages. Um, also have some PPHs. Uh, we do have pre-grant oppositions. Doesn't really delay examination, just becomes part of the prosecution. Um, our big uh, unpatentable subject matter uh, points are new uses, methods of treatment and diagnosis, material existing in nature and software per se, but that doesn't mean that computer implemented methods are patentable in Colombia. So uh, if you have any questions there, I'll also feel those uh, later on. Next slide, please. Uh, as far as uh, litigation, I think it's fairly effective. We have an extremely strong presumption of validity, principally because the court in charge, which is a separate court of reviewing validity, is really, really slow. So if the defense is going to be, uh, you know, in validity, it's not really effective if you have already a preliminary injunction granted on the other side. So, um, you know, patents are pretty strong in Colombia. We do require posting of a bond for preliminary injunctions, and if you post a counter bond on appeal, you will be able to suspend it, but 
that's a fairly quick timeline, four to six months on appeal, and the suspension will only last during the appeal. We do have an IP specialized court available, but there are regular circuit courts as well, and there are some cases uh, because of strategy, if you have like a litigation campaign where studying the possibility of using the circuit courts is also uh, a good alternative. There's really very little litigation as far as getting to a final decision, but it doesn't mean it's not, you know, litigation doesn't work. There's a lot of settlements, especially in pharma, to take place um, where you, you know, in the end, can get uh, effective enforcement of, of your patents. Next slide, please. As far as regulatory test data protection, this is for pharma, this is uh, you know really important, and, and for ag chem, I'm sorry, for pharmaceuticals, uh, since 2002, we have a five-year exclusivity term for new chemical entities, which includes biologicals. Uh, Decree 502, that one's for ag chems, they get 10 years, and they get a little bit more because uh, as of 2012, thanks to the European Free Trade Agreement, uh, that got jacked up to, to 10. Uh, it's very effective, really straightforward. You don't need any attorneys. Uh, typically, it's regulatory folks that just file the request before the sanitary authority and they get the protection. Um, but there has been some pushback in, in the last couple of years, and some exceptions are being invoked, and there's some discussion regarding terminology. But I would say overall, it's still very effective, um, and most uh, business managers expect to have exclusivity for the new chemical entities uh, to date. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as far as trademarks, we are members of the uh, protocol since 2012. Um, this uh, graph I uh, point out here, you know, along the x-axis, those are the years that started in 2012. Uh, we expected a, 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 a massive drop-off, which was not as massive as thought. There was a slight drop-off, but as you can see, the top, the uh, darker green line does uh, certainly suggest that national filings uh, continue to climb. In other words, file, filings before the, uh, the patent uh, the trademark office. And um, uh, currently, the split, uh, most people are still entering via the regular national phase, 90%, and the other 11% are entering through the Madrid Protocol. Colombia also, uh, FYI, it's about 50-50 national applicants versus foreign applicants. Um, and next slide, please. As far as uh, just some additional points on, on trademarks, we do have a multi-class application system. It's about nine-month uh, prosecution delay when there is no opposition. Uh, like I already mentioned, there is an ISP specialized court, uh, which for trademarks does handle things very efficiently. Um, and as far as counterfeiting, we do have some pretty strong activity and border enforcement by, by local police and customs. Works pretty well. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. It's on copyrights. Uh, mentioned there the Orange Economy already, which is part of the Duque uh, campaign, and he's uh, really been pushing that along. Uh, it's created some great tax benefits for a number of um, uh, production companies locally. Um, we get to see it because we have a lot of active clearance activity uh, for these productions, um, and it, it's really been a high growth industry. Um, and in addition to that, there are some specific funding programs uh, and, and tax exemptions, and not just to, to uh, audiovisual uh, production, but for other activities as well. And finally, um, for the local uh, performance rights organization in charge of uh, obtaining payments for uh, performance and for reproduction. It's been uh, pretty exciting to see how COVID-19 has actually accelerated the fee negotiation between businesses and that organization for virtual events. So um, uh, at least for them, uh, COVID-19 has been kind of a boom for them. Uh, Roberto, that's it for Colombia. Thank you very much. And uh, as you mentioned, if you have any questions after this, I'd be glad to field them. Thanks very much, Carlos, for the clear uh, slides and interesting topics, and thanks for being uh, strictly within your time. <laughs> I want to remind everyone that we are already receiving uh, uh, questions to be read at the Q&A session right after this presentation, so don't refrain from sending your questions through the email helpline we have released with your invitation. 
I will now turn to my colleague Federico Alma from Argentina to share some highlights in, in that country. Thanks for initiating when you're ready, Federico. Thank you, Roberto. I would like to thank you and thank uh, Daniel IP for inviting me to this webinar. Next, please. Uh, I will give a high level uh, overview of uh, the improvements in the IP scenario and the amendments to the IP laws. Next, please. Basically, uh, our IP laws were amended in early 2018, uh, affecting uh, both trademark, patent, and industrial molds and designs law. Um, that improve our IP scenario. Also, as an improvement to our IP scenario, we can mention the, the agreement the reached between the Mercosur and the European Union that was announced in last year, uh, in June 2019. This agreement was being negotiated for several years and well, actually, it keeps on uh, the negotiation on legal definitions. There is no an actual uh, legal text, final legal text, uh, but they're working on it. Although the agreement requires uh, to enter into force previous uh, approval from National Congress of Mercosur member countries in Argentina, we can mention that the Ministry of Agriculture enacted a resolution requiring uh, companies that uh, had prior use of some cheese-related um, geographic indications to submit evidence of use uh, of that use uh, than before 2012 or 2017, depending on the case. Next slide, please. Regarding patents, we have to remind that unfortunately Argentina is not yet a PCT country and if you think about protecting your patent in Argentina, uh, you have to find it within 12 months of the earliest, from the earliest uh, priority. As I mentioned, the patent law was amended in 2018. Uh, the main aim was of that laws was to reduce bureaucracy and reduce uh, the backlog and simplify and improve the efficiency of the work of the patent office. Uh, with that aim, it reduce uh, some terms on the patent prosecution, like the term to request the substantive examination. And also they implemented an electronic filing and prosecution system for, uh, for patent applications that was implemented and perfected before the pandemic uh, started and is actually helping a lot to continue prosecution of patent applications. Next slide, please. Uh, as a consequence, we saw that uh, the average time to first of its action was reduced by Argentinian Patent Office, uh, depending on the area, but was substantially reduced. And although there is a patentability guidelines specific for uh, general patentability guidelines, we have specific. Uh, guidelines for pharma inventions and biotech that have some restrictions uh, that some um, pharma inventions are not allowed like polymorph salts, esters, uh, metabolites uh, and in pharma, in biotech uh, there are also some restrictions that were enacted uh, a couple of years ago. Next slide please. Uh, nevertheless, you can um, speed up the prosecution of your patent application in Argentina by an accelerating examination program that was enacted by Resolution 56 that allows uh, you to uh, adapt the claims of your patent application to those granted abroad and in 60 days you will have a resolution from the patent office uh, either granting or restricting the um, acceleration of the patent uh, application. Nevertheless, this is not applicable to those uh, pharma patent uh, pharma inventions that are restricted by uh, the pharmaceutical guidelines. Next slide, please. 
also another alternative to uh, accelerate the granting of your uh, patents is through the PPA signed by pursued countries. Uh, and also it's uh, important to mention that Argentina and Patent Office has uh, several agreements with um, other patent offices that helped uh, reduce the backlog. Next slide, please. Regarding uh, litigation, we have to mention that there was no amendment here. Uh, the judges have no technical background and rely on court-appointed experts. Uh, all the procedure uh, is done before the courts. There is no before critical procedure. And remedies are available, but we have to mention that the temporary injunctions are not fast and can take up to a year or more than a year to obtain a resolution. Next slide, please. Regarding trademarks, there were several amendments introduced in the amendments of the 2018. The most important is that uh, the annual opposition procedure that previously uh, the oppositions were resolved either between agreement between both parties or if not resolved by a lawsuit. Now that resolution is done by the Argentinian Trademark Office and that uh, administrative resolution can be appealed to the Federal Civil uh, Commercial uh, Appeals Court. Also it's important to mention that now uh, a use declaration should be filed between the fifth and sixth year from grants. That is a sworn declaration of use. It does not require evidence of use, but if uh, you can submit that, uh, it's important to submit it. Uh, next slide, please. Basically, because um, as from 2023, they will start possibilities of partial cancellation. So if you can submit evidence of use, uh, you will already have that evidence of use uh, in your file. Also, it's important to mention that uh, for trademark renewals, now there's a six month grace period after expiration. Next slide, please. Regarding uh, immunity actions, they were formerly only a court uh, litigated in court, but now uh, most of the immunity actions will be uh, resolved in, at the trademark office, and only uh, some specific cases will be uh, dealt at the courts. Next slide, please. Regarding enforcement, there was no uh, amendment in the law, and the Cease of use cases are here before the Federal Civil and Commercial Courts. There are effective remedies. Uh, also, it's possible to register the trademark before the customs and the border uh, control of uh, infringement or copies. Uh, it's uh, very good and it's currently very effective, uh, effectively done by the customs. Also, there's a special enforcement unit uh, at the criminal courts and the police. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding industrial malls and the signs, uh, some uh, amendments were done and now multiple designs uh, are allowed. Uh, photographs can be uh, filed and the publication can be deferred by payment of uh, an official fee. Next slide, please. Regarding the uh, current uh, situation of the Argentinian Patent Office it's, and the uh, effects of COVID pandemic, it's important to mention that um, Argentinian Patent Office, Patent and Trademark Office uh, suspended all the terms and deadlines from March uh, 12 to July 17th uh, next, and the um, electronic filing system, both for patent and trademarks, uh, allows uh, both filing and prosecution of trademark and patents uh, without any interruption. Um, the patent examiners and trademark examiners continue to work remotely. Uh, now office actions are, are available electronically. One thing that has, uh, to, has to be noted 
is that um, the Patent and Trademark Office uh, amended its procedures to make available the office actions electronically, and this has started for patents uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, also, regarding the COVID-19, it's important to mention that something uh, that there were no uh, specific measures regarding IP, but uh, in regards to pharma products, um, there was a um, resolution issued on June 30 uh, last, um, putting a cap on the price of a pharmaceutical product, uh, that it's the Nusiner Sem, and that is the first time it happened since the mid 80s that we see a resolution from the Secretary of Commerce uh, putting a cap on uh, pharmaceutical uh, price, uh, pharmaceutical product price. So this is something we have to continue monitoring uh, because among the arguments used was the uh, lack of resources uh, and resources constraints due to COVID-19. So, with this, I uh, conclude my presentation and I turn to you, Robert. Thank you very much, Federico. And uh, thanks also for staying within your time. Uh, we are running out of time. Uh, I have lots, lots of questions here, but I will not be able to, uh, you know, answer all of them. So if you have uh, any further questions, please send to helpline at daniel.com dash, uh, sorry, dash ip.com and we'll answer that afterwards. I would just like to make uh, one question to all speakers, uh, to uh, the, I mean, to the law firms about the R&D efforts on technologies related to COVID, what would be the most relevant or efficient initiative that we can highlight in each of the panelist countries? I think we can respond following the same order of presentation. So I would uh, invite Alex Alejandro Luna for, to answer this first question. Yeah, well, with respect, what I mean is uh, with respect initiatives from the government or initiatives from the private sector. Uh, in, the intellectual, to... in the intellectual property area, any, any legal initiative on IP. Okay. There is no any initiative for IP, especially uh, focused or devoted to COVID-19 currently. What I would highlight is that uh, the efforts, some uh, scientific and technology efforts could be protected by uh, data protection. According to the international treaties, we don't have already domestic law, um, but uh, the, we have the treaties that they are in force and uh, it is possible to protect some of these efforts to get start to conduct conducting studies or tests in connection to COVID-19. That is in the IP, I, I, I would say in the IP aspects. There are other, there are some uh, various um, measures taken by the government in order to facilitate the importation, the analysis and the approval and the approvals of uh, various um, technologies or medical devices to face the pandemic. But regarding to IP, I would say that there is no specific, nothing specific already, but data protection could be one of the, uh, I would say, tools in order to uh, protect some of these uh, efforts, of technology efforts. Thank you, Alex. Well, I, I'll respond uh, for Brazil. I want to mention two things. I believe they are materially important for these times of COVID-19 and for the medications already existed. Well, the first one, as I mentioned during my slides, is the automatic granting of expedited patent prosecution for COVID-19 medications. And the other thing I have not specifically mentioned, but is well recognized in Brazil, 
is the possibility of having a patent for a second use medication. So it's a no-brainer to mention that this totally applies to everything we have heard from the media, like the hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir, just to cite some examples that are publicly known. So these are the two things in summary. The expedited examination for COVID-19 patents and the possibility of having a second use patent according to legislation and guidelines from the PTO. I will now turn to uh, uh, Carlos, if you want to mention something from Colombia, Carlos, please. We, we can't hear you, Carlos. No sound? Okay, no problem. So Federico, please go ahead. Well, Roberto, there is uh, no specific uh, resolution uh, on IP for uh, dealing with uh, this COVID-19 uh, situation. Uh, what can be mentioned is that uh, when the current government uh, took office uh, last December, uh, the, among uh, one of the first law that was enacted uh, was uh, a tax law that also includes several other issues regarding um, health issues. One of those issues was the uh, extension of the sanitary emergency uh, and in Argentina and among those resolutions, the, those provisions, there was a resolution saying that it could be um, uh, analyzed by the Ministry of Health that uh, the prices of medicines and uh, how they can affect access uh, of those medicines. Um, one example uh, of, the, of that analysis was the case of Lucina Sem. Uh, it's not related to COVID-19, but uh, it's uh, the first example of how they are analyzing the uh, access to medicines and putting uh, eventual caps to prices. Uh, also, it's provided that uh, they could analyze uh, the issuance of um, compulsory licenses uh, but it has to be mentioned that, as far as I know, no compulsory license request has been yet filed. And that's for IP as on the academic uh, area. I should mention that uh, there were several academic efforts in Argentina conducting uh, clinical trials for COVID-19 and also uh, a new uh, test uh, for COVID-19 that was developed here in Argentina a couple of months ago that helped uh, a lot in the uh, treatment of this uh, pandemic, uh, but no specific on, on IP. Fantastic, thanks very much. So to conclude now, I, I so would like to circle back to Angelica, Kaylee, Noman, and Maria Beatriz learn if they want to make some final comments before we wrap up. Please, Angelica. Yes, thank you, Robert. No, just a quick comment related to technology transfer. So there is a big joint effort now between uh, British government, the embassy in Brazil, Anvisa, uh, the Minister of Health in Brazil, Oxford University, AstraZeneca, to transfer technology to Fiocruz. Uh, Fiocruz is going to produce the vaccine here, being developed in the UK, if it works, we hope so. Um, so the technology is going to be completely transferred to Brazil. I just wanted to mention that related to the question. And thank you again. It was really um, an honor to be here talking about IP with you guys. And I'm open to any further questions. You can please relate them to Roberto. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kelly, any final comment before we wrap up? Um, much like my colleague, you know, thank you so much for hosting this and for having me today. Um, do you feel free to forward me any questions? Um, and for any of the participants uh, or viewers today who are interested in being in touch uh, with either Angelica or myself, uh, we are, um, our, web, our email addresses rather are publicly available on the UKIPO's website. So you can also find us and our colleagues around the world there if you uh, need additional resources or have any questions that are specific to our regions. Fantastic. 
Uh, Carlos, I think your mic is back. We will hear uh, Maria Beatriz and then I'll turn back to you, okay? So Beatriz would like to make some final comments before Carlos speaks and then we really wrap up. I think Maria Beatriz is not listening well. So Carlos, please go ahead and uh, share any comments you may have regarding the technologies and IP improvements for COVID-19 in Colombia. Thank you, Roberta. Just to close off there, I, I think I mentioned in general the efforts the government is making to try and fund and provide benefits for that sort of investigation. Uh, there have been some efforts uh, made, uh, a little bit on biotech, a lot on personal protective gear, um, and uh, especially a lot of epidemiological follow-up that could be done, those sorts of inventions. Um, I think clinical studies uh, are also being performed here, and there are some results which some folks locally are, are understanding now why the importance of diagnosis is important as a patentable subject matter, for example, especially some of the universities. So I think uh, we're seeing some of that. Um, I think in general, too, I think it's highlighting the need and the importance of innovation to resolve a technical problem. And uh, we see the universities in general, the private sector that's cooperating with them, making a big effort, um, for example, in the respirator field to try and, and protect uh, developments there. But they're also understanding, especially those that are looking to develop new technology that must first be approved through regulatory processes, that it's extremely important to be able to protect the outcome of that R&D. And so I think we're, we're starting to identify new stakeholders locally, and the government is also identifying them and understanding them. Um, and that I think will eventually reflect maybe in one or two or three years, but uh, in future changes in IP law. That's basically what I wanted to say, Dorf, and thank you very much again for this marvelous initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Maria Beatriz, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we hear you well. Yeah, can you please share your final comments and then we will wrap up. Sure, wonderful. I just wanted to take, thank uh, Daniela once again for this uh, initiative that is indeed wonderful. I think we have, we live in a moment with a lot of downsides, but here in this event we manage to put together people of so many different countries interacting, exchanging ideas, and looking at the Latin America region as a whole, I think this is very unique and rich. So, so thank you so much for the initiative and let's try to keep these activities uh, going. Uh, it will be a pleasure to any other event of this nature that you develop. And also my contact is available to anyone, organizers, speakers, attendees that want to reach out to USPTO. Fantastic. So th thanks everyone to all IP attaches or our colleagues located in different portions of Latin America. I hope all the audience have enjoyed. Thank you very, very much audience for having spent almost two hours of your time listening to us. We'll be more than happy to assist you in any further questions that you may have. And with this, we really finish then the event and we'll share the audio and slides after word to all of, all of, uh, all of you, okay? Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Enjoy the rest of your days. Bye. Obrigado. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Gracias. Thank, Thank you. Obrigado. Thank you, everyone. Obrigado. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.